Chloe Valdery is the creator of the Theory of Enchantment, where she uses works of art and literature to teach empathy, personal growth, and anti-racism. The art is what I think frees us uh, from that kind of mental prison. We use music, we use film, we use movies to help uh, individuals probe the depth and the complexity of what it means to be human, to again make peace with that complexity. We talked about how it works and why she's not a fan of the current obsession with critical race theory. Just one of the greatest ironies, I think, of critical race theory and that it claims to perpetuate a justice for African Americans in particular, but what it in fact does is imprison African Americans um, by, by just reifying racial stereotypes uh, about both black and white Americans. As part of our series about mediation, I wanted to hear what made the theory of enchantment different in the way it tackles polarization. So theory of enchantment has three principles, uh, three guiding principles that the rest of our work is uh, sort of uh, guided by and rooted in. The first principle is treat everyone like human beings, not political abstractions. The second principle is if you're going to criticize, if you need to criticize, criticize to uplift and empower, uh, never to tear down, never to destroy. And then the third principle is to root everything you do in love and compassion. And but here by the word love, we mean uh, Dr. King's use of the word love, agape love, which is an uh, ancient Greek term. Um, which is a, um, a love that is unconditional. Um, it's a love that is, that is directed toward other human beings simply because they're human beings, um, simply because we believe that to be a human is a sacred thing. Um, so that's what we mean when we say root in love and compassion. It doesn't mean uh, to root in liking someone <laughs> and having compassion for them, but to love, which is both uh, deeper and harder at the same time. So those, I think, are three universal principles that could be applicable to mediation. And you tweeted the other day, I, I actually retweeted it, I thought it was really, really um, something I've been thinking about as well. One of the greatest gifts that African-American culture has given humanity is its use of the arts as a platform to express the resiliency and indelible wonder of the human spirit. Critical race theory is a threat to that worldview. Could you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I think this goes back to uh, the quote I mentioned that Ralph Ellison said. Ralph Ellison wrote an incredible book called Shadow and Act, which is a collection of his essays. Um, you know, he's mostly known for writing Invisible Man, but he was also a brilliant jazz musician. And I've noticed that a lot of the early jazz musicians had this view of what was back then the sort of critical race theory of their day. Um, he and Albert Murray, who was another essayist and critic, um, wrote extensively about how there were oppressive ideologies that were essentially antithetical to the arts fundamentally. Um, because the arts are all about giving expression to the complexity of the human being and the fact that the human being is more than the sum of the policies that exist within a given society that seek to oppress that, that being. Um, and critical race theory seems to perpetuate the myth that in fact that is not the case. And in fact, the human being is only the sum of, of these policies. Uh, and so it, in this way, it reduces uh, both black and white Americans alike um, to policies, whether real or perceived, um, that, are, that are discriminatory. And in this way, it also strips, in particular, the African-American experience of its resiliency uh, and of its, of its uh, transcendent, this, this theme of the transcendent and of the capacity of human beings to transcend is reflected in you know, the poetry of Maya Angelou, the art of Aaron Douglas, the sort of what Albert Murray called the impromptu heroism of the jazz tradition, uh, which of course has affected deeply the American tradition on the whole. So I think that critical race theory in contrast boxes people in. Uh, it says that you are only the sum of, of experiences that, discriminatory experiences really, um, and and no more than that. And so in this way, it is very much antithetical to the artistic tradition, um, which is such a prominent aspect of African-American culture, which is one of the greatest ironies, I think, of critical race theory, in that it claims to perpetuate uh, a, a, 
a justice for African Americans in particular, but what it in fact does is imprison African Americans um, by by just reifying racial stereotypes uh, about both black and white Americans. Yeah, and I think that was what resonated about when I saw your tweet the other day was, I've thought about that quite a lot, how universal, you said the word transcendent, I think that fits because there's something universal expressed in the particulars of the black American experience. That, that, that's a universal story of becoming freer internally and, and going through that. And that's not to belittle the American experience that was, that was real and it was based in real physical conditions, but there is a universality to that music that I feel we lose with, with critical race theory, which kind of boxes off, off from each other. Yeah, and it also says, it also says essentially that um, you cannot put yourself in the shoes of another person. You can't imagine yourself in the shoes of another person because your experience is bounded by the racial category to which you belong. It also perpetuates the myth of a singular uh, Black America or a singular white America. One of the things that Albert Murray pointed out uh, over and over again is that America is actually a very mixed race country. There's there's very few African Americans in this country that are also partially white, and there are very few white Americans in this country that are um, not also partially African American. And so there are, there are a whole host of issues with the way in which critical race theory as a paradigm approaches the human condition. Um, and I think that we're actually going to see more and more artists, I have a feeling we'll see more and more artists speak up against um, some of the more oppressive aspects of that theory. Mm. Are you seeing that start to happen yet? So there's a very famous Nigerian writer whose name escapes me, but I just saw an article yesterday um, about how she was speaking against the, what she was seeing happen in America. Um, actually, would you mind if I tried to find it? I just tweeted it uh, yesterday. Chimamanda Adichie, who was the winner of winners of the Women's Prize. Um, she is Nigerian. And she said that there's a new liberal political orthodoxy that I believe will stifle art, particularly literature in America. Ideological purity is dangerous and is becoming the lens through which many approach storytelling in America. And I, I saw this coming for a very long time. I saw that the end game, um, I think inadvertently, I don't think it's on purpose, but I saw that the, the end game of this ideological approach to solving problems um, in our country would end up uh, just totally precluding art because art presupposes that you can put yourself in another person's shoes, that you can see yourself reflected in another person's experience uh, out of the particular lies the universal, right? All of these things are, are themes that have been uh, perpetuated by art since time immemorial and critical race theory, the tenets of critical race theory uh, claim the exact opposite, claim that that is not true. Yeah, and I wanted to do, do one specific example. You, I know you mentioned Kendrick Lamar quite a lot. And yeah. I, I was, I remember listening to um, Good Kid, Mad City. I mean, he won the Pulitzer Prize a while ago. And I, I, I think it's the closest to a novel that I've ever heard in in music, okay. certainly in rap music. And what I, yeah. I was going to use him, him as, as an example because what I love about that album and about his work is that he's not blind to the, the kind of systematic problems. He, he talks a lot about that. He talks about police brutality. But at the heart of that album is a sort of struggle with your inner demons. Like he uses yeah. a lot of biblical language. It's all about, like he's got a very keen eye for the, the personal... Uh, journey between kind of good and evil and I'd like you to hear what you like about his work and whether you, that resonates. Yeah so we teach Kendrick Lamar in the theory of enchantment training we uh, specifically use DNA uh, to teach about the fact that as human beings we all contain good and bad in us. Um, yeah I think that the work of confronting your inner demons is definitely a major theme of all across all of his albums um, and his capacity to, to sort of take, see things from various different perspectives is part of what makes him such a 
such a legendary uh, figure. I had the privilege of seeing him perform during his damn tour in Brooklyn a couple of years ago, which was quite the experience. Um, so yeah, I think that he is the, the, the artist's artist. I think he is an incredible example of, uh, of someone who gives expression to the complexity, uh, to, the, to the, the tragedy, the terror and the redemptive nature of human beings. Um, I think that he is what uh, James Baldwin spoke about when he made made a contrast between like the very like uh, ideological uh, the ideological writer and the true author, the true artist, which he made he made that distinction in an essay called Everybody's Protest Novel, which I also encourage everyone who might be listening to 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 read. Um, but I love Kendrick Lamar. He also has an incredible, uh, there's an incredible video online where he's talking about empathy <laughs> specifically. Um, he's talking about it within the context of Compton, but he, but it's, you know, universally applicable. He specifically speaks about being able to put yourself in another person's shoes. So it is precisely like the artist tradition, ultimately, that is one of my biggest motivations for uh, getting theory of enchantment out there as an alternative and much better anti-racism program than some of the the ones that are being peddled right now. Um, and Kendrick Lamar, as well as other um, artists um, that we teach, I think is is I, I'm very grateful for their work because it exists to to be in service of of the artist tradition. Yeah, and I think as you were saying before, you can't make great art with without kind of seeing the messiness like you can't make great art yeah. without if, if you've got if you only see people as victims or you only see people as as oppressors like that's it's just not very interesting it's it's a very yeah. boring way of looking at the world yeah great art lies in ambiguity great art is comfortable in ambiguity it's comfortable in nuance it's comfortable in as you said that messiness because that messiness is life uh, and and any paradigm that promises salvation by by preaching that you'll be able to escape that or that you should escape that messiness or ambiguity is really doing a disservice, I think, ultimately to you because it's the messiness is obviously just that messy. It's hard. It's it's difficult to wrestle with and confront. But I think doing so is at the same time part of the thrill of being alive uh, and what gives rise to to the to the things we love so much and human beings. This is why also we, we use so much pop culture because really pop culture is, is so much a vehicle for the arts. Um, it's what we gravitate toward as a culture, right? It speaks to us, it resonates with us on some deeper primordial level. And so um, I, I, I believe that we at all costs must preserve that. And if we don't preserve that, like if a, if a, if a culture's art starts being destroyed, that's when you really know that I think you're on your way to some very hellish uh, outcome as a civilization. You talk about Dr. Martin Luther King a lot. And I think it'd be interesting to, to understand, like in a way, quoting Martin Luther King nowadays in a lot of anti-racist context is kind of considered really naive. Like, oh yeah, that was okay for back in the 60s, but, but now critical race theory has shown that we can't be colorblind. We've got to be conscious of of color in every single interaction. Um, I'd like to start, what, what do you think of that change? And do you think there's a chance that that things could go, that his um, perspective could be reinvigorated? Well, I suspect that the folks who say that that was then, this is now, haven't seriously uh, contemplated or studied Dr. King's sermons or um, moral philosophy um, because that's such a sweeping dismissive statement. <laughs> um, a lot of people fail to realize that his moral philosophy was rooted in the idea of the sacredness of the individual. It was radical uh, simply because it took the position that not only was the oppressed oppressed uh, and a victim uh, of the oppressor, but the oppressor himself was also a victim of his own sort of ideological possession. Uh, and that's a very different, um, that's a very different worldview 
uh, this idea that that by engaging in nonviolence, uh, you will you are doing so in order to in order to display your love of every human being, including the person who is oppressing you, um, is a very different worldview than that being than than those being per perpetuated by critical race theory, um, which has no sort of transcendent moral ethic. There, I, there's no like there's no uh, at least that, that I've seen, there's no sort of uh, promised land <laughs> to quote Dr. King that is being uh, articulated as a vision for where we're trying to go. There is just, you know, if you are white then by virtue of being white, you're racist. Um, if you are black, then you are oppressed. And it's just very uh, reductive and uh, uh, very superficial and very shallow. It has to be rooted in something that's deeper than race, that that connects us all, that's a universal pr principle, a universal moral ethic uh, in order to make sense. And Dr. King believed in the redeemability of human beings. But if you keep telling people because they're white that they're racist, then that, that presupposes no room for redemption um, because you can't, there's nothing you can do to change that. Um, and redeemability presupposes, presupposes the capacity to change. Um, so it's a very fixed, narrow, double-binded system um, that is oppressive to, to, I would say, both the acolytes of the philosophy and those upon whom the philosophy is imposed. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the sort of universal value of, of Dr. King, and it reminded me there was a really interesting uh, discussion between Coleman Hughes and John McWhorter and they kind of diverged on this point about whether, I think it was Col Coleman who said he thought that the fact that there was a religious, he was holding up a religious vision, Dr. King was holding up a religious vision. Coleman questioned whether if you had a strictly atheist worldview, whether that would be enough. Yeah. And I think John McWhorter said it probably would be because he's a bit more maybe hardcore atheist. Um, but there's an interesting question here. Is it possible to have a uniting vision without this kind of transcendent story. And that's, I'd, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts on that. Do we need this sort of transcendent story to, uh, as a kind of destination almost? You definitely need a transcendent story. I'm not sure that John McCorder would say that because he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in a transcendent story. Like Sam Harris is an atheist who believes in the transcendent story. So there's a slight distinction there. I don't think you have to be a theist in order to believe in, in a, transcendent story and I recognize that that's a little that's messy in and of itself um but that's a whole four-hour conversation that I'm not going to get into right now mm -hmm. but yes to answer your question there has to be a transcendent sort of universalizing principle that enshrines or that uh that celebrates the sacredness of the individual that's ultimately what ha what it has to be rooted in otherwise there's no reason Otherwise, there's no reason reason that racism is actually morally wrong, without mm -hmm. that. Um, and this is sort of the this is sort of the uh, irony and contradiction within critical race theory. If if you do not hold that the individual is sacred, there is no uh, basis upon which to claim that racism is wrong. Mm. Yeah, and I guess this is the the same territory that. Jordan Peterson, Peterson and Sam Harris got kind of caught up on. Yes, that's why I said I'm, I'm going yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably more than four hours, but, but it is interesting. I mean, I find it a fascinating subject and maybe one of the most important, like how much is our assumption of the transcendence of the individual contingent based on the fact that we're in a Christian worldview without kind of realizing it. And, uh, and I do, yeah, I don't know if anyone necessarily knows the answer to that. But it's I think it's, yeah. it's, uh, and I think Jordan Peterson would actually probably agree with this. It's definitely contingent on us living in a Christian society. It's not, but it's contingent upon multiple different theologies, both contemporary and ancient. Um, and not just Christianity. It's very, it's very, I think this idea was of the sacredness of the individual was in the making uh, through before and through the, up to the development of Christianity. 
Um, and Jordan Peterson talks about some of this in some of his lectures, or he like, he, he demonstrates this in some of his lectures. Um, uh, but I will say that I do, I mean, I, I personally think Sam Harris lost that debate. I am biased, but I do think he lost that debate. Uh, and I, I think we've, we're seeing sort of the ramifications of him losing that debate play itself out in our political conversations in America uh, in 2020. Uh, I think that critical race theory for some has replaced uh, religion, has filled the vacuum of religion. Uh, it has a very puritanical streak to it, uh, which is which speaks to like, like the fact that I think whether you're atheist or not, human beings are fundamentally religious. And the basic meaning of that is we all worship. Now, what Sam Harris worships versus what I worship may be different and is different, but we all fundamentally have a drive to worship. Um, and so in that sense, I think that the that the dichotomy presented between between athe atheism and theism is sometimes a little bit shaky. Can you say more about why you, th in what way do you think Sam Harris losing that debate is sort of cascading through the, f are you saying the fact that he doesn't really understand the stickiness of religion or the fact that we're all thinking in religious ways? I mean, some people would say that Sam Harris is also kind of a fundamentalist in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, is, that, is that what you're referring to? The fact that we're all, um, we're all thinking in religious ways, no matter what. Yeah, what what uh, critical race theorists would say about race, <laughs> I would probably say about religion, um, <laughs> which is that it is like all encompassing and it's primordial and it's like it, it was a part of our evolutionary development. And so you can't just uh, you cannot so easily divorce um, the capacity to develop a moral ethic from that from the like biological impulse uh, to worship for whatever reason that we have um, that Jordan Peterson has obviously like articulated in many different lectures. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's also telling because the African American tradition is so religious um, and so much very rooted in a spiritual worldview. Um, and that, that would, that would be another irony I'd say uh, in the sense that like critical race theory seems to be very much um, ignorant of or oblivious to because it champions the material outside world. Whereas the African-American tradition has always, including in its more militant uh, manifestations and here I think of you know Malcolm X, A Nation of Islam, even in its more militant manifestations, there's always been a spiritual uh, worldview, which is to a certain extent about the inner life of human beings, not about the outside world. I mean, so much of the civil rights movement and the Kingian uh, worldview was rooted in this belief in the inner life of human beings and in the spiritual life of human beings, as opposed to the external as opposed to merely the external physical world. So this is part of a series of films that I'm doing about mediation. The topic of mediation, the topic of polarization, how do we have generative conversations? So your work focuses mostly, I'd say, on, on race, the topic of race and, and overcoming divisions around that. But do you think it is a, a uni it's more universal than that? Does it, does it apply to other areas of like polarization and discussion and mediation? A company's approach to anti-racism training is very much rooted in developmental psychology um, and this idea that racism flourishes when individuals are experiencing some kind of psychological insecurity, usually along the lines of a feeling of insignificance, lack of belonging, lack of purpose. And then they develop a, a measure of self-contempt and then they overcompensate for that self-contempt uh, by gravitating toward uh, supremacist ideologically ways of thinking or ideological ways of thinking. And we know this because we know, for example, that white nationalists organizations exploit the insecurities of individuals to rope them into their organizations. 
So my, my company is really focused on helping people uh, work through those insecurities, make peace with themselves, make peace with the human condition so that they don't overcompensate for uh, those insecurities, which then sometimes leads to racism. So it's a very much like from the inside out approach. Um, and, and, you know, we teach the writings of Baldwin and Dr. King and Maya Angelou, but all of those great writers spoke about race within the larger context or against the broader canvas of the human condition. Um, and one of my favorite uh, sort of uh, lines that, that Ralph Ellison, the author Ralph Ellison once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that um, he had no problem with those studies that illustrated the discriminatory policies that existed in America, but he did have a problem with those claiming that he was the sum of those of those policies that he was, or he that he was not more than the sum of those policies. And it is this idea that we are somehow only reduced to discriminatory policies within society that is actually incredibly oppressive uh, toward the human spirit because it what it does is it boxes us in, it stereotypes us. And the art is what I think frees us uh, from that kind of mental prison. Um, so we use the arts as a platform within Theory of Enchantment to teach people about the freeing of the, of the human spirit. So we, we, use, uh, we use music, we use film, we use movies to help uh, individuals probe the depth and the complexity of what it means to be human, to again, make peace with that complexity um, so that they come into, whether it's the workplace or another space, uh, like internally free. Um, and, and that makes them much more open, I think, to uh, toward others and more uh, capable of naturally and organically cultivating a diverse and inclusive space in the first place. Who would you say are the artists that, or, or works of art that you think are like really important that have informed your work? Definitely Nina Simone, um, Leonard Cohen. Like if this was like Chloe Valdery's canon, what would be in the canon? <laughs> yeah, there's island, there's island discs we have in, in like, the UK. <laughs> nice. Um, Bob Marley, Shakespeare, um, Ralph Ellison, I mentioned, James Baldwin. So some people only think of these people as like critics, but I actually think of these individuals first and foremost as artists. Um, Beyonce, Beyonce has some very interesting Peter Jordan Petersonian esque things. I had a conversation with his daughter about this. Mm. Um, well, you really put me on the spot here. I wasn't expecting this question. Mm. It's good though. Uh, Maya Angelou, definitely, who's like my spirit animal. Mm. Um, hmm. Ben Howard, who's a great UK artist. Now I'm just list listing my favorite artists though. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know how relevant that is, but I love Ben Howard. He was the artist who got me into guitar. Um, Yossi Klein Halevi, who's an amazing Israeli artist. Almost, almost all as well. Um, just let me look at my my books over here. A little Dostoevsky. Why not? Yeah. Um, some, some moody Russians. <laughs> yeah, Tolstoy, um, Anna Karenina, definitely. Well, I haven't, like, I'd love to hear more about, like, your artistic influences as well. Hmm. Um... Yeah, well, Kendrick Lamar is is definitely up there. Um, I loved uh, growing up. I loved a band called James, and I recently yeah. did an interview with the lead singer from James. That um, they, I'm, I'm kind of deeply interested in spirituality and spiritual transformation and all sorts of spiritual practice. And I loved that band growing up. And then when I interviewed him. Tim Booth, the lead singer, I found that he was, the whole music was coded messages. And he didn't want to oh, admit wow. at the time, like they were, they were in this kind of, um, 
they were all meditating and doing spiritual practice all the time. It was the only thing that he was very sick and it was the only thing that kind of gave him uh, some yeah. strength was to, to meditate and to kind of do yoga and stuff like that. And they didn't want to admit because this was the 1980s and they thought it was really uncool <laughs> to be meditating and doing all these practices. So they didn't actually say, tell anyone. They just put it all in the music. And so it was wow. really fascinating to then hear that um, I, I'd heard these these songs in my head like time and time again over the last like 20 years and they were sort of messages that he said yeah I left a paper trail for people to follow that's that, awesome yeah it was really beautiful and amazing and it, actually in the interview I did with him he said oh this is my coming out moment this is I'm finally <laughs> coming out you've tracked me down and now I'm coming out and, and saying what was yeah. actually behind the music um so that that's something that has meant a lot to me um I studied English literature and so the romantic poets, Blake, um, Coleridge, like those, mm. those sort of first, the first wave of kind of part drug induced, part spiritual madmen kind of that you found coming into the, in romanticism and William Blake and all of that. Um, I'm yeah. fascinated by those. I'm fascinated by, I guess, I, I love, like I, like I said, I love black American music but I also, I, I think the, the British tradition has something really incredible going for it, like Shakespeare, obviously, and the, yeah. the, the, the depth in Shakespeare is something, like he kind of formed, he, what I find extraordinary about Shakespeare is he, he formed the English language, like the English language didn't really, it hadn't fully come together, there was, there was like, Half the aristocracy was speaking French, the, the peasantry were mainly speaking Anglo-Saxon. English was a very uncouth uh, language. And then in Shakespeare, it, he actually sort of formed a co like, yeah. almost like a consciousness. He formed like the whole consciousness of English and the, and the, the English-British mentality. <laughs> yeah, if you think about like one person who had the most impact on the history of humanity, you can make a strong case that Shakespeare has had yeah. one of the strongest influences. Um, yeah. And there's something very extraordinary about how he's present and not present in all of his, all of his works. Like he, mm. he did x-rays of the human character and did it so well that they're still relevant now. Like yeah. the tragedy of humanity, Shakespeare basically kind of laid it all down and laid it all out. Um, so I'm... What's your favorite uh, thing by Shakespeare? Um, I've got a soft spot for Hamlet and Macbeth just because I studied okay. them quite a lot and I, I ended up with quite a few of the, the, the kind of soliloquies and stuff in my head so they kind of come, yeah. come to me every now and again. What about That's yourself? Awesome. What's your favourite Shakespeare? The Tempest. Mm. Yeah, it was uh, 11th grade in high school. We, that was one of our English language literature assignments and uh yeah i love the tempest it's really beautiful they say it's like the culmination of shakespeare some people say that awesome that was a nice little digression at the end yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you're gonna like keep it but <laughs> i'll send you a few links um i think you'd like I, I did a short cut down of the interview i did with tim booth so i can okay. send that to you um james i think awesome. there's, there's some uh, there's some beautiful amazing songs that they that they did that I think are only are only now people are starting to kind of recognize that there was a real spiritual depth to them uh, that people just didn't really pick up at the time even though they got quite big no one really got them no one really kind of understood what they were about I think do you think that I, I find that this might be the case do you think that people search for spirituality when they need it the most I think genuine spirituality is when your current you outgrow your current way of being in the world. And that mm -hmm. can be when a relationship ends, it can be when you kind of, uh, like that's classically a midlife crisis is where you realize mm -hmm. like, like that's genuine spirituality where the volume gets turned up on everything, good and bad. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I think that that, and then you hear things with a new ear, you start to kind of perceive things in a way that you, you just hadn't before. And then suddenly you, songs you've been listening to for like 20 years you're like oh that's what they were talking about because yeah. <laughs> it wasn't until you were in that 
more vulnerable place or more hopeless place or yeah so that for me is like it's it's it's, it's where we one some of our conditioning falls away and then there's the, that process of we have to go down before we can come back up again i think i'm really um intrigued by the work of carl jung and his whole mm. Uh, exploration of the unconscious and you know this is obviously reflected in uh, our sort of archetypical uh, films that we've told each other in the western world and by that I mean it is in as much as it is within you know the film The Lion King it's also within Kendrick Lamar's work um, and this is the other thing I'll say about critical race theory it denies the centrality of the African American contribution to the Western canon mm. because it because it presents this dichotomy between the West, quote unquote, quote unquote, when in fact those two things are one and the same. Um, so, yeah, I, and, actually, and actually probably fueled America's success more than anything yeah. else. America's yeah. cultural supremacy is based... It's precisely because of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that hip-hop, like, hip-hop is similar to jazz. Mm. Um, and hip jazz has very, is very much a, a big influence of Kendrick Lamar's style, uh, mm. which is interesting. But hip-hop is similar to jazz in the sense that both have this, like, uh, this heroism culture, this capacity to do, like, to, to do like improv uh, and to, to, to not only improv with the beat or with the, with the musical style, but improv with life itself. And Albert Murray says this about jazz and I think it's true about hip hop as well. This mm -hmm. gives us, and by us, I mean all, all humankind, this actually gives us a model or a blueprint for forming a healthy relationship with life. The ability to wrestle and, and adapt and that flexibility uh, which is also lacking from critical race theory and not possible within critical race theory. I should write an essay about how critical race theory specifically is the antithesis of the artistic tradition within African-American culture. That's a yeah. powerful essay. Yeah, because, because by definition, art is going into the unknown. Yes. Art is always about going into the undefined and everything is defined. Everything is defined, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is no unknown. <laughs> everything, yeah. everything to quote Ibram Kendi is either racist or anti-racist. It's like... You should definitely write that piece. <laughs> yeah, that would be so good. It would be That's so good. That's such a great headline. Critical race theory is a betrayal of the, of the creative history of, of Black America. Yeah. That's, that's a powerful frame. I mean, that's it. That'll, I feel like that's a, if not, if not the fatal stab, that's definitely a wound. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I'll have to think about that. I'm working on another piece right now, but maybe this will be the next one mm. that I write. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, you're the perfect person to write it. So I, I hope you do. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.